on this computer. All right, I am here with Shannon Roberts, and uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, and your background and how you got into counseling and psychology and all this great stuff. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for allowing me to come on the show. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. So yes, I'm Dr. Shannon Roberts, and I have been in a private Christian counseling setting um, for the last 30 years, 20 of those being in Tampa, Florida. Um, I specifically work with couples um, having walked through expertise training and experience and people think I'm crazy because I also do it in a format of a two day intensive, which is 16 hours or equitable to six months worth of counseling in the traditional hour weekly kind of format. Um, but I absolutely love it. Um, I got into um, psychology and or counseling. Wow. A dinosaur ago, having grown up in a divorce family, uh, my mom having been divorced um, seven times, my father four. Um, I just know the repercussions of what, you know, a family foundational system functionally and dysfunctionally can and could look like and some of the, you know, difficulties and challenges um, coming through uh, the brokenness of a family system. And uh, I guess kind of being like everybody else that gets into counseling or psychology or trying to maybe fix yourself first. So, um, but found my own personal healing journey and have been doing and, and wanting to better myself personally and professionally along the way ever since. And it's just really exciting to um, be kind of in that front line and ushered into, you know, people's most personal space um, to be able to offer hope and healing. And it's just a, a passion and a, a, a calling. I feel so fulfilled in being able to walk that process with people. Wow, that's awesome. I did not know that. That's that's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you talk about your intensives, which uh, me and my wife actually went through. So that's <laughs> very, very difficult thing to do, but very, very beneficial. And it's changed our marriage you know, completely, really. Uh, oh, wow. I'm so glad to hear uh, that you guys are still just flying well. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Those, those couples that, you know, both show up in the room, um, want to roll up their sleeves, say, hey, I'm not settling for mediocrity or vanilla. We're doing the hard work because it's so worth it. And so those are the ingredients of success. And so you and your wife actually, you know, were one of those couples that said, we're going to keep at it till we figure it out. And you did. Congratulations. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't easy, but it was, it was worth it for sure. Um, so tell us this, you probably, you've obviously spoke with, I don't know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of couples by now in your, your right. third years of going through this. What would you say is a, is a very like, common mistake that you see couples make when they're trying to just stay married and be together and, and, and thrive in a relationship? Is there something that just comes up over and over and over? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of couples come in and they have kind of areas of issue or areas of challenges. Some you know, or across the, you know, norm that you would think they would be, whether it's parenting or extended family or finances or sex or, you know, those are topics. But the most common mistake is that it's not that they fight, it's how they fight that becomes the most problematic in the relationship. And so I kind of start with really taking a deeper dive and helping them understand how and why they show up in that fight cycle the way they do and how it kind of prevents them from finding some kind of um, closure or reconnection or even the ability to have work through problem solving and managing that conflict well. And so they will find that they are in this same cycle, same dance, no matter what topic that they're talking about. And a lot of times before the couples get into the um, counseling room, they've done that cycle so uh, often and so long, it becomes rigid and chronic and a lot of times unyielding. And so sometimes undoing those neural pathways in the brain and re structuring a, a new neural pathway that creates that culture of care 
that want to, that shifts the emotions back to each other um, to create kind of that closer connection and intimacy across the board is the thing that has eroded because of this fight cycle. And so a lot of times people don't realize that it's how they're fighting that keeps them disconnected. So they're fighting poorly, right? They're, they're yes. not doing it the most effective way. So I know your intensive is a lot, uh, you know, many hours on that subject, but if you can just give us something, a tip, like, okay, so for example, John Smith and his wife, Betty Smith, they fight a lot about money or they fight. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Just give us something. I know it would take all day to, to, to give us the whole thing, but how could we do it better? How could we fight yeah. better? Okay. Fighting fairly. I wish that it was just a contracted thing. Hey, here are the fair fighting rules. And a lot of couples will come at it from a kind of contractual negotiating behavioral kind of you know, perspective, but let's be honest, when emotions fly high, and they usually do, especially in romantic relationships, because romance and passion and love are emotional. And it matters to us in the moment that our, our um, partners see us in a benevolent light. And a lot of times in that fight cycle, um, it, we perceive our partners not to be loving, accepting, or available or responsive to us in a way that um, we feel kind of raw and exposed. And so I first I want to just say it just th those fair fighting rules go out the window immediately when those emotions kick in and we don't become ver best versions of ourselves. We find ourselves saying and doing things that we normally wouldn't say and do in our right mind with anybody else on the planet, right? So mm -hmm. I'm just offering this initial words of hope that, you know, it's 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 true of com common to nature. It's a hardwired fight, flight, or freeze system that we are programmed to do in our brains. We move into self-protection and we throw out the, the window um, with these kind of, I'm supposed to be in my rational brain and, and, and getting out these fair fighting rules. And it, it just doesn't always operate like that. It's not as, as quick of a fix like that. So I'm offering first the hope to, of knowing that we aren't these ways for, you know, because there's something, you know, wrong with us. This is common to um, human nature. But lastly, our bodies give off a signal and, um, you know, it's that kind of um, electric cur uh, thing that goes off in your body that warns you about what's about to happen. You know, it's kind of that sucker punch moment where I liken it to having been next to a cliff and like your body's telling you it's a dangerous situation and our bodies respond to emotional danger. So if we do perceive our partner to not in that moment feel as if they're safe or secure we feel that same electrical current go through our body somewhere whether it's your chest or your stomach or your throat or whatever and so knowing yourself and slowing down that process so that you can um, take a quick nanosecond moment of deep breath or you know offering whatever's necessary in your partner's distress to calm the situation before you move into discussion of the the details um so that rhythm is learned um we teach it um obviously in the intensive you're right it's something that we really hunker down on and we make you understand a little bit about what your particular action tendencies are in the moment so you know exactly what those are um, but most in, and foremost is just um, being able to map your cycle and know what it looks like so that it, when it starts to show up, you recognize it for what it is so that you can begin slowly putting different action tendencies. If you can go into those, and, and sometimes it's after the fact, sometimes you have to go back because it's gotten away from you too quickly and be curious instead of, you know, dogmatic, you know, that and rigid in your thought system um, and being curious about, so what were you feeling in that moment? And is that when you said or did this, you know, so that you understand better um, and slowing that down and taking in each other's, you know, perspectives, perspectives. There's a lot of times couples will come in and they want me to be the referee 
who's right, who's wrong, you know, take sides, tell them this. Definitely wanted well, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, can't you make them see it from my perspective? And listen, we're all wired different. We got different gendered brains. We've had different personality hardwires. We've had different environmental cookings throughout our life. We are both going to see a version of perceptual truth and they both count. And they're both real in each other's bodies. And so changing the stories we tell ourselves about our partner, that as much as I want them to understand my perceptual truth, I, I have to show up with curiosity to understand theirs as well. And so adding um, both sides of that equation, um, so it becomes an us perspective rather than moving one person over to one side and bringing them to my perspective. Mm, that's so true so would you say like rather than trying to always avoid fights just learn better how to actually fight more effectively or argue yeah more. absolutely yeah. listen let's be Not avoid fights because they're gonna yeah, no i mean fighting in and of itself is not unhealthy um really healthy relationships have to have areas of disagreement but they have to have healthy ways of work through of those um, disagreements and of those challenges. And so coming back to a place of mutual respect and agreement and then mutual reconnection point is absolutely necessary. Sweeping it under the rug, shutting it down, swallowing hard. Over time that erodes the want to, and we don't show up anymore in the relationship that creates that closeness and warmth and connection because of that. So mm -hmm. actually fighting is healthy and normal. It's, it's again, just not that you fight, it's how you fight. And so I say, I usually replace the word fighting with protest. We're revealing something in ourselves that we are not liking and then we want that to matter to our partners. So seeing that that protest is an opportunity of discovery and learning and knowing our partner and um, they're revealing parts of themselves. It's easy to tell our partner what they're doing that makes us happy and that we like. And then um, it's harder for our partner and sometimes harder for us to reveal areas that don't feel good or that feel like an ouch. Um, and it mattered to our partner enough to say, I see you, I know you, I, it, it, this matters to me too, you know, but healthy ways of doing and approaching those protests give the opportunity of deepening intimacy and knowing of one another, especially in the areas of our specific vulnerabilities and sensitivities that we all carry with us in life because of our own personal experiences. Yeah, that was one of the biggest eye openers, one of them, uh, when we did the intensive was just when you mapped out our childhoods and yeah. why we do what we do when we're fighting, why we either retreat or we just bark even louder or get crazy and, and just picking apart our childhood and said, okay, well, this is why you do this now yeah. that you know why, and just knowing why you do it. Cause it's right now, it's just autopilot. This is what I do when this happens, like an algorithm. Uh, but just yeah. knowing why helps it so much because you're like, oh, well that makes total sense. Cause when I was a kid, this is what happened. And this is what I would yeah. do. Nothing's really changed. I'm just a big kid now. And, and trying to break, like you said, break those patterns. I love that. I love that. I'm just a big kid now. That's true because sometimes we revert back, you know, into yes. those same kind of action tendency, autopilot behaviors. But it's interesting that when we do that, that deeper kind of look back work um, with your partner in the room, mm -hmm. what used to be areas of idiosyncrasies that we would like point out in one another, see as annoyances or maybe even use it as a weapon against each other right. now shifts the emotion towards more empathy and compassion as they understand where and why those points of pain develop those kind of tendencies and um, actually self-protection um, in, in, in the, in the relationship. So it, it shifts their view of things of you. And that takes a big amount of trust because when you share that with them and they know what, what, why you react the way you do, they have the power now to use it for compassion, like you said, or against you. This is why, because of this. And yes. So it's, it's a power that you're giving your partner. 
which is yeah but what we've learned is um vulnerability if we're willing and able I, I know sometimes that's incrementally um, baby steps, but if we're willing to present and expose in a vulnerable way, that will breed vulnerability on the other person's end too. So softening and opening usually sets tone for the other person to follow suit. Nice. All right. So let's talk about, you know, in our culture right now, normally how it goes is you meet a girl or a guy, a girl meets a guy. They go on some dates. They usually have sex before anything, before marriage, before whatever, you know, trying out the cow before you, whatever the saying is, the, get the cow in the for free. If whatever. you give them the milk before they buy the cow, they don't buy the cow. I don't know. Buy the is. cow and you get the milk for free, right? Uh, that's, that's, it. right. Wow. that's it. So that's right. That's it. Anyway, they live together. They play house. This I'm wondering, are you referring to the cow being the woman or the man? Oh, I'm not going to go either way, you know? <laughs> I'll do the man for now. Uh, so okay. uh, then they they live with each other. The next step would be to move in. And this is way all before marriage for, in, in our culture today. And for most people, I would say 90%. Uh, and then they play house. And if everything seems to still get along, they, they take the plunge, they get married, they have the kids and things like that. So what would you say to a couple, maybe that's listening right now, who maybe they're engaged, they're about to get married. Like, I just, what are they not thinking about? before they, they take that big that big plunge? What, what advice would you give them or what, what should they be thinking about before they actually go through with this commit, lifelong commitment, hopefully, of marriage? Yeah, gosh, oh my gosh, that's such a big question. I could like spend hours on that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, basically, you know, I do see these um, people that date and then they get engaged and they spend all their energy, you know, on planning this big event. And um, a lot of expense, which is, and listen, I just did it for my daughter not even a year ago, and <laughs> it was quite the party um, and wouldn't have done it differently. But I guess one thing I would say is, you know, plan for the long haul, plan for the long term relationship marriage equally as much of the investment of time and resources into the event of the ceremony. Um, so a lot of times people don't think that um, if they're in love and everything seems bliss, why would they even consider doing any kind of counseling? Um, and so I, I say premarital coaching. It, it's easier to go into a relationship the right way with you know steps of prevention of what not to fall into um, more than remediation after having been in it and those patterns already have begun to solidify and having to undo them and um, rebuild them differently. So I think that would be the biggest piece of advice um, life transitions are difficult, whether you're living together before you're married or not living together before you're married, before you're tying together your finances, um, before you, you know, have a kind of long-term goals, short-term goals, how you're going to get there, role division in the relationship. There's so many things that couples don't even think about that they might have had to discuss and talk through before they get there. And so, you know, being able to prompt those kinds of questions and discussions, create the communication around those harder topics early on that are healthy might be, you know, some good pieces of advice. Yeah, like anything else, make a plan, right? And put yeah. an effort into it, just like you're doing with your wedding. Everybody goes so crazy about the wedding, the day of the, the, the event, but what about the next 50 years? The long term, right? Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So now the couple's married, they have a kid. What is that? And, I, and honestly, I believe, and I could be completely wrong, but I believe it's more here in America than other countries, just from my wife being from Argentina, you know, I'm getting a good amount of experience with people from different countries and all that, but it seems to be a bigger problem here than it is other places. When they finally have kids, some women turn off the sex button in their head. They don't want to have sex anymore or not as much or even half as much why is that? And, and I know that's frustrating for the guy and I know it's not good for the girl either. So what, what would you tell a couple who stopped having sex after their kid was born, even months and months and months after, and they get into that pattern, what would you tell them 
for advice or why does this happen? Okay, let's start with the why. That's such a good question because, you know, couple, and listen, it's not just as they're having their first child. This is major life transitions that tend to impact the closeness and warmth that ultimately impacts maybe the sexual intimacy piece. Um, and so you're so right, but when we begin adding to our plate with these areas of huge responsibilities, um, listen, couples don't do the intentionality piece. You know, um, one of the biggest four um, reasons why people lose intimacy and bond is just inattention and um, gosh, laziness. So um, we don't realize that just because one and done, we found each other, we professed love, we um, committed to one another, you know, we've begun building our home, that that relationship still needs just as much oxygen and just as much nurturing over the course of time as that little baby who demands it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to put that in the back burner um, because the urgent becomes more important. And so there's a number of reasons why this shift can, you know, happen away from sexual intimacy. Of course, we can go to the biological, you know, the physiological for a woman giving birth. There's so many different bodily shifts, so many um, different hormonal shifts that, you know, as they're coming out of healing um, chemically and physically, from that kind of traumatic experience that it's a relearning of their body and a relearning of, you know, how their body might respond. And then we're going to just talk about just kind of the, the incorporation time-wise. I mean, they are on sleep deprivation, sometimes um, an adjustment of finances that puts additional stressors um, so these two ships that pass in the night, you know, kind of divide and conquer, you go here, I got this. So unless they're, you know, able to be habitual, if they have support to still carve in private time to be able to be just an us apart from the family is really important if that's possible. Um, a lot of times men will have a difficult time in shifting, not being the center focus of their partner's, um, you know, priorities and affections. Um, there's so many different dynamics that go on in that. Um, and listen, <laughs> no longer is it the romance, you know, it's just, it, it, it begins like, okay, functional, right? Sexual is a functional need for the relationship so let's do it we're stealing time i'm very tired and so couples do not spend the necessary time kind of doing the arousal ramp up system and so women feel like maybe they're being just used and they might slip into duty sex or obligatory sex and if we spend that time just still doing that thing as we are dating and as we're um, newlyweds of all of the sexual intimacy, because listen, sexual intimacy is a big umbrella. I mean, it doesn't mean intercourse and climax. That's not the goal of sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is closeness and warm warmness and connection. So it, we can't forget the, you know, passionate kissing and the affectionate fondling. And, you know, um, sometimes it's just foreplay and cuddling. And sometimes it does um, culminate into other ways of uh, other pleasurings. And then, you know, if it's sometimes and hopefully ultimately ends in penetration and or climax, that's wonderful, but sometimes that's not the goal. Wow. So for, for men, don't just, you know, not try to romance her anymore and just, you know, focus on your work and, and the kid and all that. And women, same kind of thing. Like he's still, has needs as well yeah well, so i would say as a man um you know your your um, wife is not feeling attractive i mean depending on you know body weight and how long it takes her to feel back kind of more comfortable and normal in her own skin whether she's nursing you know you know children hanging off of her all day long so making them feel beautiful regardless 
And then for women, I would say, you know, um, opening it up the frame of mind that, you know, your body go, go in with curiosity and adventure. So to discover, you know, how your body can still move into that steamy hot now moment and um, allowing that experience to allow her body to kick in and get there. Awesome. That's great advice. Um, so now let's talk about if they've been together for a long time, maybe the kids are almost out of the house or maybe they're not, maybe they're, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and they just can't make it work. It's just struggle, struggle every day. It's more pain to be in the relationship and everyone they think both of them are thinking we want out. What would you tell them? I mean, is, is it for the kids is divorce better if they're fighting every day and the kids are seeing the fighting or is it better for the kid to have mom and dad there, even though they're fighting, but they're still together? Like, what would you tell like if they're, if they're trying to be on their way out? Like, yeah, this is, this is a tough one, Matt. And I'm, I'm saying that because as a marriage counselor, I see couples that come in that are fighting for the marriage. And then I also see couples come in saying, is it time to end the marriage? And I am not typically one that's going to say, yeah, you guys can't work this out. You know, you need to go consider divorce. What I say is, regardless of whether you are in here to save your marriage, um, or regardless if you're going to try to discover different ways and approaches um, to move through that decision making of when you determine when to say when in your marriage, learning how to mutually respect and communicate um, because you're still going to be hinged as co-parents. Mm -hmm. So it, regardless of whether you do counseling to come out, you know, in, in a more connected romantic relationship or a, a healthier version of yourself and how you show up with your mate in a co-parenting, I would say counseling either way will help you in the decision-making process and will, will make that decision smoother for you. And the couple, um, the, the whole family unit will benefit on the other end regardless. That makes sense. So why is counseling so taboo here in America? It seems like in other countries, this is, you got, you guys are just like emotional, mental, you're like coaches. Like if you want to get your body in shape, you go to a, a personal trainer. If you want to get your mind and your, your emotions and your, your relationships better, you, you go to someone like yourself. Why here is this such a, Oh, what's wrong with them? They're going to counseling. Oh, you, there must, they must be messed up, but everywhere else. Like I, I listen to my, my wife's family and other people I know from different countries. It's just normal. Everyone needs it and goes and nobody ever thinks anything. Wow. Right. That's fantastic because we need more people like you shot it from the mountaintops, I guess. Okay. No, um, I, you know, it's a great question. Um, I do think it's get the, the stigma is getting better and better, especially through COVID as mental health and mental awareness not only became more front center, you know, in, in the, you know, media world and um, opportunities were expanded through telehealth and um, all those kinds of things. So I do think it is getting better. Um, but listen, I love the way that you framed it. I mean, if we move the, you know, message that, only sick people go to doctors, so therefore sick mental people go to counselors, then yeah, it, there can be a, a very big stigma on it. But if we move it into the realm of health and wellness, mm -hmm. that it's more about you know coaching and not diagnostic um, intervention of getting you from sick to better, then uh, it, it can be embraced a little bit more. And then, so I love the way that you created that framework on how to couch it. But more, uh, more importantly, you know, we are a, a nation in our culture that we're all about, you know, um, self-sufficiency and um, success and power and, and, and drivenness. And so, um, anything that, you know, is seen as less than um, might be perceived as a, a weakness or a flaw. And so I think as, in our culture, as we become much more accepting of our, you know, areas of vulnerabilities and our desires to want to um, 
improve in those areas and, and that we do need, we're a culture that we need connection, we need one another. I think that's come out of COVID too, that we realize that that disconnection cannot be good for people as well. Then um, I think it does further the cause of uh, people being more open for sure. Absolutely. It's like if you know, you're eating healthy, you're, you're doing preventative, like you don't have to get sick. If you go to coaching and counseling, you can work on the tools now where you don't have to almost get a divorce. You can just learn the tools early, right? To fix that before it happens. And it's right. It seems like it makes a lot of sense, but even I love myself, it. Like it, I remember the first time we stepped out and we're like, shit, I hope nobody saw us go in there. You know, like you feel shame, you feel embarrassed. You feel like, Oh, well, yeah. I need help. You know, like no one wants to admit they need help or, or that. Well, let me, let me, I know this is a, your podcast and you're doing the interviewing, but I mean, I know you're an advocate. You probably are the best version of yourself in the way that you show up as an athlete, in the way that you show up as an entrepreneur, businessman, gym um, owner, and you know, producer. When your most important relationship is going and thriving, right? Because mm -hmm. mind, body, spirit is so connected, and that, and re your relationships are included in that. Absolutely. Yeah. When you, when you get that part, right, everything else feels like you're unstoppable, but when it's bad, you don't feel like you can get anything done. You just feel, you know, it, it kills yeah. everything else. It's so Absolutely. True. Absolutely. So another thing I wanted to ask you about was like personal counseling. Like let's say someone had a very traumatic childhood, which everybody has their own tra traumas in their childhood. Yeah. Whether well, like, it's big T or little T. Yeah, absolutely. You no. Know, there could be sexual abuse, which I think would be terrible, like one of the worst, in my opinion, or there could be just a parent who wasn't there emotionally or even physically. Um, we all are screwed up in a way, right? And we come into <laughs> adulthood, you know, broken, right. all broken. And then some people that go through major trauma and the way that they respond to it are the resiliency factors in their life um, might not come out of it the same as somebody that else that would have come through the same trauma so it's your also you the way that you lean into it or not you know so it, there's a lot of you know different layers absolutely and so for, let's just say someone has a medium trauma i don't know if we could and maybe they, they can't afford counseling or maybe they they just can't bring themselves to do it but they know they got stuff going on that is affecting everything that else that's going on around them, every relationship with every woman right, or right. whatever they meet, repeating patterns and just mm -hmm. what could they do to maybe without counseling, right? They can't afford it or whatever excuse they have. What right. can they do for themselves mm -hmm. to, to heal themselves? Yeah, I, I think, you know, 40% of the effectiveness of even professional counseling is just finding that safe space with the person that they feel trusting and connected to a good fit. So, you know, there's something about finding whether it's a pastor or a mentor or, you know, someone that a more seasoned person in the area that you respect um, that you've seen walk a path that, you know, spending time with allowing space to, you know, explore. I mean, there's a lot of literature out there, a lot of, you know, formatting of ways and approaches of taking steps of self exploration, and being able to kind of expose pain, um, just to somebody that cares and listens and is compassionate. And um, then moves you through that process to a place of healing and forgiveness and, um, you know, res restoration in the areas of your um, idiosyncrasies. So I think just finding relationship connection where you're seeing heard and known and they care about you. Compassion is really important. So if, if you can't afford a counselor or all that, you need to find somebody. Some, you can't do it by yourself. Do you need someone else to say this stuff to? Can you do it by yourself? Can you just say, all right, Matt, this is what happened. <laughs> I did this and my mom did this. I, it was ah, whatever. They were hurt. They were hurt. Yeah, they hurt me. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, there's a lot of theories out there. I do think that when you're doing mental work, um, speaking it, hearing yourself process pain out loud is important. 
Okay. It stores it in a different place in your brain. Mm. So yeah, I do think finding a safe space to speak it out loud is important, not only for yourself, but then to see and feel the acceptance and warmth from the other person, maybe um, that you didn't receive and needed it to hear and receive. Absolutely. So, so if the issue is with mom or the issue is with dad, do you, in order to truly get by it, do you have to forgive them? I think forgiveness is a big word. Yeah. Um, and so let's just replace that because people have such preconceived uh, ideas of what that looks like, mm. should be like, has to be like, maybe it came from um, church. I don't know. I don't know where. So let's replace that big word of forgiveness to release of power over. Mm. So um, if you can detach from the hurt and pain that and make the decision that you no longer want that to have power over you that's a process of forgiveness um let of letting go of um that pain so that it doesn't impact you any further and having that person impact you any further um if we put it on a biblical model i mean 70 times 7 is um not necessarily allowing the same offense to happen that many times but choosing to um, release it that many times because it's a process a lot of times. It's not a one and done thing. So let's switch it from the, the child, which is probably an adult now, still harboring resentment to their parents, to now you are those parents. Is there anything, let's say these parents that maybe did do bad things, raising their kids, whatever. Is there anything they can do to help heal their kids? You know what I mean? Like, let's say there's parents in their 70s who have even... 40, 50 year old kids who are still upset with them. Is there anything they can do? Like if they just apologized or if they just, even if they don't think they're wrong, like would that help? Like, is there any advice you'd give them? Oh gosh, to get the power of a parent being able to hear and validate your pain. Oh my gosh, that's hugely impactful. Um, if, a, if a parent has the, you know, emotional intelligence and integrity to say, yeah, I did not do things perfectly. Absolutely. I wish I, I, I think all of us could look back and, and pick and choose, you know, gosh, if I had that to do over again. <laughs> um, yeah. So just being able to, you know, acknowledge that it was not a perfect path, but I definitely did it from a place of love, you know? Um, yeah. Absolutely. I'm always thinking ahead and, you know, I have nine, seven and three-year-olds. So I'm thinking, even I'm doing my best, right? Nobody's a perfect parent. I'm doing the best I can, but I know no matter what parents listening to this, when you're older and your kids are out of the house, they're going to have something. Even if you were oh. what you thought was the perfect, like you did the best job you possibly could have. There's always going to be something that they're going to be like, yeah, my mom always did. Yeah, this. mom, but I've already gotten it. Hey, listen. And yeah, I'm you're right there. Counselor. I mean, my worst fear is that they end up at a counselor's office talking about me, but it, it will, it, hopefully it will happen. I mean, I want them to be able to find their own personal journey where, you know, as fallible as um, I have been in my own parenting personal journey. I mean, yeah. I mean, will it be easy the day that they probably come and say, you know, this was really painful for me. I, I hope that I'm prepared to just give them room and space to share with no, you know, judgment and with no defense and just total compassion and validation and love. So that would be a good mindset for us to be preparing for when, yeah. not if, but when it probably happens. Yeah come to us upset about something. And, and even, and what I noticed is a lot of times the parents don't even like realize that that's what happened. Like you yeah. really felt that. Or that they perceive that. Yeah. That they perceive that to be, because it, you know, you, like you've taught us in the thing, you, two, two different crime scenes, you see two different things, two different people. And maybe they didn't see that at all, or even realize that that was happening or that they felt that way this whole time. And now they finally realize it. So instead of saying, well, I didn't mean to do that more like, well, I'm sorry that I didn't even realize, you know, just being like yeah. you said, more open about it. Or a lot of times families don't talk about things. And right. so left with uncertainty, children tend to fill in their own blanks and they get it wrong. And so sometimes just the conversation brings clarity to the details that they never had. And it can shift the emotional response to it as well. Mm -hmm. I love it. 
This is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, is there, if someone's in Tampa, how do they get in touch with you if they're having either A, and I hate to just say having trouble in your marriage. If you just want to have the best marriage that you could have, even if you're doing great, yes, or having trouble in your marriage, how could people get in touch with you? Do they have to be locally here in Tampa or do you meet with people all over the world? How, how does that work? I do. I, I, I open up my um, borders to, you know, anyone even beyond the Tampa Bay region. Um, they can get in touch with me with Shannon at shannonrobertscounseling.com. Um, and that's one in S H A N O N shannonrobertscounseling.com. I have a, a free 30 minute consultation, um, you, you know, that you can sign up for through my website and we can get on and we can talk about your unique circumstances and what your path looks like moving forward. So it's and, open to me, buddy. Okay. Awesome. And, and I know like some people who are not of faith or religious or, or Christian or whatever, right. they didn't see Christian counseling and to know that you've done that and do do that mm -hmm. and be like, well, I'm not Christian. So I'm going to go, go somewhere else. Yeah. But I'm, even me right. trying to tell some of my friends, like, that's not, that's not it. Like this stuff is still going to help you whether, you know, yeah. you're Christian or not. Like, how, how does that work? So, yeah, I mean, I work with people of faith base and, uh, and then others that are not electing to go um, incorporate that into the, you know, programming either. So before I began working with, you know, individuals and or couples, I do a thorough intake assessment and they fill out some paperwork and I, in, I interview them as to what their comfort level is to incorporate the spiritual component. So you don't, I don't force anything on anyone. It's always um, according to what they feel comfortable with. That's awesome. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. And Absolutely, uh, Matt. It's been a joy talking with you as always. Yeah. And as far as that intensive, all I could say is like, for me, you, you could either want to like go do the lessons over time. And some people, they learn better that way. For me, I'm an immersion guy. Like, give me it all <laughs> right now. We'll go <laughs> home. We'll practice it. And I, like, you know, that I says a lot for a guy that says, Hey, yeah. I was there. I did. I was there from, you know, 16 hours and we got her done. Right. We, did it. we got some babysitters and we did it like a nine to five Saturday, Sunday. And we, we got it, we made it happen. And it was the best That's decision right. we made as a couple, you know, great that. investment. Yeah. Great That's investment. Great investment. All right. You tell your lovely bride. I said, hello. Thank you for having me. I will. Thanks. Shannon. Take care. Appreciate right. it. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.